once again, Kejan, thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. Uh, the Indian fans obviously have uh, wanted to hear from you for so long. Uh, so firstly, you know, going back to your debut back in 2002, uh, you've been in this business for 15 years, for a decade and a half. So firstly, you know, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts, uh, your perspective on how the MMA landscape has changed over the course of uh, the past 15 years. Oh, it's totally different, man. It's, uh Growing in leaps and bounds, you know, like in the very beginning when I started, it was still called No Holds Barred, it was still called NHB. Um, now it's mixed martial arts, it's widely accepted. Like, uh, it's a completely different ball game, man. Like, back in the day, it was almost more of like a, like a tough, like tough man competitions, you know, like not everybody had martial arts experience. Some guys wrestled in high school, some guys like were Taekwondo dudes. Or like karate dudes that were were getting like disqualified at like karate tournaments, you know what I mean? So they wanted something a little more hardcore. And a bunch of us were just like street fighter dudes that wanted to scrap and not go to jail. <laughs> so uh, so we scrap in a, in a cage or in a ring or wherever they put us. Um, and now it's just exploded, man. Like we're on track to be. Yeah, I believe we're on track to being the, the, the number one sport in the world here very shortly, so very cool, very cool time. Right, and talking about yourself, uh, you got the call from UFC during the TUF Canada was Australia season back in 2013. So after you know being in the business, being in the fight business for over a decade, what was the initial reaction when you were selected uh, in the TUF season? Uh, relief, <laughs> really. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, at that point in my career, I was, it was really difficult for me to get a fight. It was hard for me to, because uh, my record at the time, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was something like 19, 11, and 1. So I had 30 fights, but um, I didn't have a record that was um, very attractive to somebody to beat. Like, I wasn't like 30 and 0 or 25 and 5 or something like that. When, when you beat a guy like that, it looks very good. Um, at 1911 and one, I was super dangerous, but there wasn't a lot to win by beating me. So it was very, very difficult for me to find fights outside the UFC. Um, and I had just come back off of uh, off a of broken orbital as well. So uh, I had had a big layoff, and it was a real struggle just to get back into shape to come into, into competing because I gained uh, some double vision in certain fields of vision, like by Anywhere from here up is double when I look, or anywhere from here over. So I have like this limited field of vision that's like singular. Um, so that really, it threw me for a loop, and uh, it, uh, it really made me have to go back and learn how to fight all over again. So it was, uh, it was a very difficult period of time, and, um, and I was really questioning whether or not I was, I was going to continue, like I was going to give it, I think I got... I ended up getting the call somewhere around like August, September of 2013, and I had said uh, a couple months previous that I was gonna I was gonna continue to try until the next year until 2014. And if I did, if I wasn't able to get a fight by the time 2014 rolled around, then I was gonna go back home and hang it up and figure out something else. Right now you're saying that uh, even during the TUF season, you were injured. You fought injured. Uh, you've also said said that you know when when you uh, had your second fight, you were still injured. So what kind of a toll does that have on on a fighter emotionally? Uh, well, you kind of get used to it. You kind of get used to fighting injured. Like we're always somewhat injured. Like very rarely. There's only been a couple fights, um, up, like discounting the beginning of my career because it was still fresh. Like I was, uh, I hadn't incurred a lot of damage at that point, um, but. For the later parts and portion of my career, at least the last two thirds, for the majority of the time, you, the training camp will take its toll, right? Like you will end up having some sort of nagging injury, even if it's a small thing like a, like a toe or, or like a, a real bad shin bruise or something like that. Um, or you'll fight sick, you'll fight uh, with a cold or something because when you're, when you're putting yourself through a very rigorous training, training regimen, and at the same time, you're dieting and really watching the market and take. Uh, it really takes a toll on your immune system, so you're much more likely to get sick around that time. So a lot of the time, like, I've, I don't know exactly, but I've probably had, like, between four and, five, and, and six fights 
uh, when I was sick and I had like some sort of a uh, cold or, or even a flu. Um, so yeah, it's always something. Uh, you get you get used to it, and uh, now I'm quite used to it. Nothing really surprises me anymore. Right now, talking about injuries, uh, you know, you last fought in the UFC nearly two years ago. So this is your first fight since I, um, uh, if I remember, September of 2015. So yeah. how has your journey been from you know uh, during this long layoff and your journey back inside the octagon? How has this uh, journey been for you so far? Uh, it's been difficult. It's been exciting. It's been blissful. It's been this is like a roller coaster. You know, like up to down, like life is, right? Um, so I injured my shoulder. Uh, I don't really understand how it happened. Like I've watched the tapes over and over again. There's nothing that happened in that fight that would put my shoulder in jeopardy. But for some reason, my labrum tore completely off. My rotator tore. So I ended up having to get surgery um, and then rehab that. And by the time I was a little bit through rehab, I kind of realized like, okay, I'm running out of money. I don't really know how I'm going to sustain life. Um, so what I did actually was I, I did a I did a motivational speaking tour. I I booked a flight back to BC and uh, and booked a bunch of dates and did this motivational speaking tour. I generated a little bit of money. Come back and then I'm like, okay, and now what? Now that money's running out, you know. So um, it kind of made me realize, like, okay, I can't really make money out here. I can't make money in Montreal, so maybe it's best that. I move move back home, move back to back to BC, and uh, and figure out something to do there. Um, and then I talked to a couple of my friends, and uh, and they were planning on opening a gym. Um, so I went in with them. We opened this gym. Um, one of the one of the partners ended up not being a standout dude, so we had to get rid of him. But that was me and my best friend. We've been friends for like I don't know, 15 years or something. Um, so yeah, we've got a long, long relationship. She's an awesome person too. She's a actress and stunt woman. She's in Montreal right now, shooting some crazy big movie. Um, so yeah, and, and I came back, and then that whole thing—that's a whole other thing, you know, like a whole gym uh, <laughs> expedition was a whole growing period as well. Like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ups and downs there as well. At first, it was really good, and then. We had some headaches. We ended up having to move location six months in uh, because we thought we were getting that noise complaints for some reason. Um, the person that we rented the, the space of thought it was a really good idea to put an MMA gym underneath a school for autistic children. <laughs> Probably the worst combination <laughs> possible, right? So he was always getting upset. And I was like, "Oh, you guys are making too much noise. And all they hear is this bang, 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 <laughs> grunting." Dude, you rented it to us at a major. What did you think was gonna happen, man? Like, what are you, what do you expect? Um, so yeah, that didn't end up working out all that well. We ended up having to move spaces, but we found a great location that was right off the street, seven seven five nine Edmund Street in Burnaby. It's an amazing spot, um, and so we moved, and then that was great. And we got this new location. Everything's going good. Bam! My second partner turns out to be this complete con man, uh, thief. Uh, liar, drug abuser. <laughs> so we had to cut him out. Um, so he's gone now. But that was a whole nother huge headache, like legal battle, uh, lawyers, lawyer fees, a bunch of gym members left because they took his side. And then we had to kind of build up from scratch again. But it was necessary. And we, we put in the hard work. Um, I'm lucky to have my partner. She's amazing with that whole business and the whole like legal end. Probably should have been a lawyer, but she's studying, right? So that's a little bit more fun than being a lawyer. Um, so yeah, that ended up working out for our benefit. Now we've got a really, really, really good group of people that we're all very connected. We've all got each other's back. We're like a family. You know, we're like a unit. We do everything together. There's no more division at the gym. And now I'm much more happy in my life. I'm I'm health more healthy because I'm more happy. I've got no stress. So I'm less injured, uh, and it's just created this situation that I'm in now, which is the perfect situation to fight in, where I'm 
happy, I'm healthy, I've got a really tight group, group of motivated uh, individuals that are supporting me and helping me teach classes and, and, and having my back and making sure they're there for all the sparring sessions and, and getting a little injured by me here and there, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great situation that we've, we've been able to create. Um, and it, it wouldn't have been like this if we had gone through all that turmoil, you know, and to weed out all those little parts. Right, so uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be grateful for the struggle. As, as grateful for the struggle as you are for the triumph. Right, absolutely. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, since you know we were talking about injuries, and you fight a very aggressive, a very physical style. Um, so did you ever think maybe you need to, you know, kind of uh, tone it down a bit? Maybe you know, not be as aggressive inside the cage, just because, uh, as you said, the past couple of years there was certain injuries that happened. Did that ever cross your mind? Uh, if you if you watch my last two fights, I have a completely different style. I, I changed everything. After 2014, after those, like, I got consecutive knockout losses, which has happened. At, like, I don't know anybody that's come back from that side of the truth. Um, I, lo- I got knocked out on Top Nations, got my jaw obliterated. The guy, like, literally punched my chin off. Like, broke it here, broke it here, broke it here just like destroyed it right and then my next fight i fought tai Hin bang on ufc 174 even worse knockout like uh, it didn't look quite as brutal but the, the post concussion symptoms lasted for like seven months um so i had to really take like a step back and be like okay uh, what am i missing here there's there's a flaw there's multiple flaws in my system and i had to do a lot of research and uh and completely changed the way I approached everything um, and developed like a new style, develop a new way of fighting uh, that was more in tune with my own personal physical gifts um, because I was here and there, not, not the whole time, sometimes I was I, I was uh, using the martial part in the correct way, but just a smaller, uh, less diverse way, but in, especially in the 2014 fight, um, I was trying to use a game that was meant for somebody that had a crazy amount of durability and a crazy amount of power, right? And I'm I have, I'm a powerful person. I have I have knockout power in both my hands, but it's not that one shot death touch that certain people do have. Like that's that's never been my gift. It's something that I've had to develop. It's not something that I was born with. And for those that one shot like sleep uh, power, you get something that you're usually born with. Right. Um, so, so I, I had to realize that and uh, develop a game around my own personal physical gifts, which is movement. Right. I think I'm a better mover than pretty much everyone in the world. Movement, especially dynamic movement, the ability to learn dynamic movement. Um, I think that's my is my my superpower. You know, so I built a game that's based around that, um, and it's made me much, much, much more difficult to hit. And uh, and since then, in like on the feet, I have been punched twice in two fights. So uh, so so far it's working, and I'm going to uh, continue that trend here in the next couple of weeks. Right. So now talking about your upcoming fight at UFC 215 against Adrian Martins. Uh, we have seen that he is a very you know, dangerous submission artist and has very s- uh, slick submission skills. So, can you also tell us what you have done in your training camp just preparing for this fight? He doesn't really sub a lot of people inside the train. He has, like, he's got a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's a world champion of some sort. I don't know exactly what that means. Like, there's multiple different organizations that claim to have the world champion, right? Um, and I don't, I'm not sure at what belt he won the world title. Uh, but regardless, he's, he's got world-class jiu-jitsu skills. Um, but he, if you watch his fights, he doesn't really use it very much. Um, he does use it here and there. Uh, like, if, you, if he drops a guy, he'll jump on him and try to sub him. But for the most part, unless you're really tagging him up and piecing him up on the feet, he's just going to try to knock you out. Like, he's got more knockout wins than anything. Uh, usually with the right hook. Sometimes with the left hand, he's got a good left hand, he's got a good right hook with his southpaw. But he's pretty much like a one-shot power puncher. He's one of those guys 
that has that one shot death touch that I'm talking about. Right. Um, he, he can get you out with one shot. So, um, so yeah, I've I've got a couple. He's got an interesting ground game as well. Uh, he likes to play like negative half. Um, uh, he likes to he likes to attack the Kimura and then mount and then uh, hit you until you put, until you turn your back and then he'll jump on your back and choke you uh, if he doesn't get the Kimura. Um, and I've, I've worked on some things to nullify that. I've also, of course, worked on my own, my own gifts on the ground, my own, my own game on the ground. Um, but I think, I think personally, I think he's going to try to knock me out. I think that's his. I think that's his game plan. I don't know a hundred percent because you never know what they're going to do. You can never expect too much. But if if I was in his brain, if I not in my brain, if, if I could put myself into his body, into his brain, into his knowledge of martial arts and his coaches, uh, I would look at my fights and see that I've gotten knocked out consecutively, deep, pretty recently, not um, not super recently, but pretty recently, within the last couple of years, right? right? So a lot of times people see that and they're like, okay, this guy's chin's done, he's got his jaw broken, his chin's done, he got knocked out twice in a row. We can, we, all you gotta do is touch this guy, he's gonna go out. Um, so I would imagine that they're gonna try to knock me out. Now I do the right things after I take concussive blows like that. So uh, my chin isn't gone. I have been hit here and there in training camp, and um, it actually feels much better now than it did before any of those knockout losses. Like directly before, when I, directly before those knockout losses, I was getting a lot of gym wars. And uh, I was getting buzzed in the gym quite often. Um, and I think that's what had weakened my chin a little bit more. So when I got hit in the ring, uh, I didn't have that brain strength. I didn't have that uh, ability to withstand, withstand the shot that I normally would have. Uh, but now I've got a completely different approach. I don't take damage um, uh, in the ring. I, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in the gym, I don't take damage. Uh, we have a very, very intellectual approach so, um, so yeah, I don't. I think that's going to be very, very difficult for him to do. Right. So you know, during this discussion itself, what is very apparent is uh, we understand that the fighters have shelf life. You know, it's not as much as uh, anyone else in any other sport or any other industry. So, you know, I just wanted to also ask you this. Uh, you were in the news recently, a couple of months ago, with the whole athlete retreat. You know, uh, so what do you think needs to be done? for a athlete representation in MMA and for the athletes, for the fighters to get better conditions, better working conditions? Um, well, for representation, uh, I believe that we do need to form some sort of a body, uh, be it an, organ uh, an association or a union. Uh, there is the MMA FA, um, which is, is, a, is a union, I mean, a, an association that, that people could join. That may be the answer. Um, but I'm looking towards, really, I think the model is, the best model is SAG or, um, or ACTRA. Uh, SAG is in the States, ACTRA is in, in, uh, in Canada. And they are, they represent the, the film, film people, stunt people, the, uh, the people that work in, in entertainment. Um, and they've got a really cool model because all of these, uh, like I said, my partner is uh, probably, probably the best stunt woman in the country. Um, so she's been able to give me some insight into the benefits that they have. And they are actually independent contractors, right? So that's the big issue is we can't form a classical union uh, because we're not employees. So if we wanted to form a classical union, we would actually have to go through this big long court process and fight to prove that we are employees in fact and not independent contractors. And then if we fight to prove that we're employees, now that union is, can only be within the UFC. Which I think is a little bit short-sighted. Um, I I think it's going to be best if we're able to include all of the top promotion, um, just like uh, Actra includes all of the top production company, right? So you have to have a certain amount of credits in order to get recognized by the union uh, as it's for Actra. Just like us, you would have to have a certain amount of fights to get recognized by the union, or a certain uh, the, the organization would have to have a certain amount of like televised fights or something like that to get recognized by the union and then all of those unionized fighters will be able to work with um, all of those unionized promotions and then ACTRA or 
our whatever whatever body that we created, um, the the model of Astra would be able to then negotiate on our benefit and have collective bargaining agreements with these promotions so that we can speak it with one voice and actually be heard, set proper minimum wages, make sure that we have benefits, uh, even if we get uninjured out of camp, if we are union, then we should be getting a specific amount of benefits, like, because for instance, like, I got injured, right, I got, I, I tore my shoulder, now I had to move across the country and set up an entire business, now I have this whole other business to run, while at the same time, trying to be a professional athlete, that could have all been circumvented if I had some sort of living expense right. while I was recovering from my injury. Like, the UFC did end up, did pay for my surgery, so I am grateful for that. It's much better than me standing in some line waiting for Canada to pay. Um, but uh, you're still, it's still on you as to how you're going to actually survive and get back in the cage after. Right? So all of right. these things need to, be, need to be addressed, could be addressed if we had an organization like that. Right now, so and then you're, yeah, please go. Uh, yeah. So the other question, right, was uh, uh, what was your other question? Sorry, exactly specifically. The fighter conditions. What can be done to improve the fighter conditions? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So and to improve fighter conditions, I think the best, the the first thing that needs to happen, uh, it's not the complete answer, but the first thing that needs to happen is we need to have the Ali Act adopted to fit us as well. Um, so, we do have this in Congress right now, it's, got, it's called the Alley Expansion Act, right. and it has, uh, it, we've, I think we've got like 36 congressmen and congresswomen right now that have signed on um, as a co-sponsor the bill, uh, and, and it's, it's gaining some real momentum. Uh, I was out there recently, right before the athlete retreat, actually I flew from Congress to the athlete retreat, um, and I was, I was in Congress lobbying for this bill. And it's gonna it's gonna do a lot. It's gonna create transparency, so we know what the company is making off of us. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna kill all the boards and boards and contracts, so um, fighters aren't having to give away their the rights to their name and likeness in perpetuity throughout the universe for all of eternity. That's the actual lang legal language of my contract. Um, so that really precludes us from being able to do a lot of different things that we could do if we still own our actual name. Like, we're almost slaves, right? Almost slaves. Um, so there's a, there's, a number of, there's a number of things that, that this would do to, uh, to really help fighters. It would allow for us to move back and forth between organizations much easier. So the Aliyat uh, piled with uh, us having a union uh, or an association that that recognizes multiple different promotions, uh, all the top level promotions and all the top level fighters, um, the two of those things together is going to completely equalize the playing field. We're gonna the fighter will actually have the real power. We'll be able to have a lot more earning power and a lot more say in a lot of the things that are happening, like um, drug testing and minimum wages and everything under the sun, you know? It's been, right. It would be an amazing time that Right, so I was going to ask you about the Ali Act, in fact. Uh, but do you think just the fact that fighters are seen as independent contractors and not employees could kind of hinder, you know, the expansion of Ali Act into uh, MMA as a sport? No, because boxers are seen as independent contractors as well. Right, yeah. and it has to be that. Um, now, a lot of people say that, that the Alley Act isn't really used all that much in boxing. Uh, and that's really on the boxers, right? Like, um, if you have the legal language there to support you, and you're being exploited by whatever promoter, and you sit on your hands and don't do anything, well, that's your, that's your fault, right? If, if we have the legal language, now we'll actually be able to go to court and deal with these things. And a lot of the time, these, this act is actually used in boxing, but it just it doesn't look like it is because it never makes it to court. Just the threat of a, of a lawsuit or of taking the match to court will kind of guide the negotiations into a place that's a little bit more mutually beneficial. Right. Um, so, you know, you also recently spoke about UFC having plans for financial uh, incentive or initiative for the fighters. Uh, going forward, I think from October, that's what you said. So, 
can you also give us a few details on what UFC might have uh, planned for the fighters? I don't know, man. They, they know I like to talk, so they're not going to tell me exactly what they're planning. Um, they're staying pretty tight-lipped about that. I tried to pry it out of them, but they wouldn't let me know. Uh, <laughs> I know they were, doing, they were trying to release it in August, and they were really excited, and then they hit some sort of logistical roadblock in some way, and now it's going to be pushed to October. They're talking about October 1st. Um, so I'm really interested to see what that is. Uh, but as to exactly what it entails, I have no idea. I just know that it will do. It will have some sort of financial benefit to fighters. That's all I know. Okay, and you know, uh, in in the, the world of combat sports right now, there is one topic. Other than you know, a couple of days ago, you had the John Jones fiasco. But other than that, the world is talking about Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather. So, as someone that has been in this sport for you know a decade and a half. Do you think this kind of opens doors for fighters going forward, MMA fighters, to just, you know, kind of explore a different dimension that hasn't been seen in the sport since? Yeah, I think it's great, man. I think it's great. Like, for one, that fight wouldn't even be happening if there wasn't an Ali Act in boxing. Because the Ali Act in boxing was what allowed Conor to go and do that. As soon as he got a boxer's license, he was now covered by the Ali Act. So he's able to go and put on this and build a promotion company and actually make dollars on the back end as well as the front end, which is what all the boxers did as soon as they had the Ali Act, which is why the UFC is like, no, Ali Act, they're spending millions of dollars to stop it in Congress. Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think it's really good, man. Like, uh, I, I don't know how good the fight's going to be. Um, it might be amazing. Uh, who knows? Uh, I think Conor's going to come out and be pretty wild in the beginning and then uh, and really try to knock him out. And I think... Floyd might get hit once or twice, but he's so experienced, dude. He's going to just stay under that shell, that turtle shell, and just uh, weather the storm and then all point him for the distance. And I think the last six rounds are going to be pretty boring. And uh, everyone's going to be like, oh, we paid 100 grand for a ticket. <laughs> Watch the like, ah, you're a dumbass. <laughs> like, you're paying for the hype in that fight. Like, you're really paying for the hype. But it's cool. It's cool to see the crossover. Uh, like, Muhammad Ali did that way back in the day. It was an exhibition fight, but when he went over to Japan and, and fought this wrestler you know, guy under like Nick Star's rules, yeah, I know Kia. Right. Um, so I think it's cool, dude. I think it's cool. I, I would like to see more like more things like this. Uh, it's just anything that puts a lot of money in fighters' pockets, I'm about that, man. I'm about that. So good on Connor, dude. That guy is a magnificent manifester. He has some serious powers of persuasion and manifestation. I think he's got the whole, I think he's, uh, I think he's a hypnotist. <laughs> uh, I have this theory where he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's, he's learned some gifts of hypnotism and he's just, he hypnotizes people. He's got the whole world hypnotized, like, like on strings, little puppets, you know, like, uh, it's really funny. It's, it's pretty interesting to watch, that's for sure. You can't, even, even if you're skeptical and you kind of can, can, can see behind the curtain, you, you still can't stop on watching. Like, I'm going to watch it. Like, I, I can't help myself. I'm going to watch it fight. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, the last thing I want to ask you is, you're going to get back in, inside the octagon after two years. So, what can the fans expect? And as you said, you made some changes to your game. You, you know, uh, in the past couple of uh, fights itself, you've kind of adjusted uh, to play to your strengths more. So, what can the fans expect come uh, your fight at uh, UFC 215? Uh, they can expect to see me being me, you know, like, uh, I don't really know what's going to happen, I never really know what's going to happen, um, I'm not one of those guys, I'm not trying to be Conor McGregor, I'm not going to go out there and try to predict uh, an outcome, I'm open to to all outcomes, I know whatever happens will serve me to my greatest good, and um, I do see a, a couple of holes in this guy's game, I know that there's some distances and some ranges and some positions that he doesn't really understand, so I'm going to try to maximize those positions and, and distances and ranges and, uh, and minimize the, the positions that he's good in. Um, so they can, they can look to see some, some pretty interesting things, no doubt. Like, no matter whether I'm going out there being super aggressive or not, uh, the technique that I use is always pretty and interesting. So that's the thing for you. Pretty and interesting martial arts on display <laughs> at a high level. <laughs> right, so the other uh, thing that I want to ask you is, uh, do you have any message for your fans in India? Because as I said, after 
watching you kind of uh, standing up for the fighters a lot of people are uh, you know talk to, uh, talk to us to get uh, you on the show just to uh, let you explain about what's next for the fighters what can the fighters expect going forward in the sport itself so do you have any message for the for the indian fans uh, to all the fans in India, uh, I want you guys to know that if they ever put on a UFC India, which I believe they're trying to do, I have a feeling they're trying to do because they just signed Arjun Buller. Uh, I know that they've been in talks with Gary Mangit for a long time. Uh, if they ever do do a UFC India, I'm going to do everything on my power in my power to get on that show. Because I went to India actually, I went and I cornered Gary. And, uh, and called her Black Mamba. I called her. I cornered both of them in uh, in New Delhi, uh, in like 2012 or something. And it was an amazing experience. The fans were so stoked and receptive, and it was a really really cool place to be. Uh, and I would love to fight there. So yeah, if, know that if they if they put on UFC in India, I'm coming. So you were here for the Super Fight League first season, I'm I'm guessing. Uh, I think it was the second. I think it was the second. It wasn't the one. That had Bob Sapp on it. All right, it's the second uh, season. It was, yeah, it was the second season. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. Right, fantastic. So, uh, you know, as I was saying, we look forward to having you back. Uh, obviously, getting UFC fighters in India is, is is the next big step that we're looking at. So, anything that we can do to help uh, help you with that, we'll be more than happy to do that. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again, Kayan, uh, for talking to us, and all the very best for your upcoming fight. Okay. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to see you.